right, today I want to talk about bevel gears. And to do that, we're actually going to back up a little bit and talk about plain old spur gears like we've seen in the past. All right, so what we have here are really two wheels and axles. We've got a wheel sitting on an axle and another wheel sitting on another axle. And these two are pressed up against each other. Uh, and so as one turns, that is through friction between these two wheels going to cause the other wheel to turn. Now, I don't care which side we choose to call the input or the output side. That, that's not important here for this. Uh, what we're simply looking at are simply two wheels and axles on two parallel shafts. Now, the issue shows up when we deal with just a wheel and an axle is that if there's not enough friction between this wheel and this wheel, that is, there's not enough force pressing these two together and the right types of materials between these, uh, if one wheel turns, that doesn't necessarily force the other wheel to turn. So uh, rather than dealing with wheels and axles, we simply put gear teeth on these and suddenly we have spur gears. Now I'm not gonna draw all the gear teeth on these gears, I've done that before. You can, you can see that in one of the other videos on gears. But I want you to realize, once we put gear teeth on these, as this gear turns, that forces this gear to turn with it, unless we're in fact shearing off gears or, or literally breaking the gears. And to show this from a slightly different angle, let's look at this from the top. Okay, now the first thing that some of the eagle-eyed viewers out there are gonna point out is that I labeled this as 50 teeth and this is 25 teeth, and yet I did not draw the appropriate number of gear teeth on these. Too bad, okay? It's, I don't wanna, I ain't got time for that, all right? So, moving on though. Uh, the reason I drew this this way was to simply show what the gears would look like when we viewed them from above, or if I was to view these gears from up here, what we would see is this, and we've got, two shafts. And the reason I drew this is to illustrate the issue that these shafts, whether this is the input or output, and whether this is the input or output, these shafts have to be parallel to one another. Uh, we'll see, there's a line of action between these two gears, and that line of action sits right here and right here, depending on our view. But this line of action occurs between these two gears right along this, this red line of action. You'll notice that line of action is parallel to each of these shafts. And so while spur gears are incredibly, incredibly useful, there's one big limitation with them. And that is the two shafts have to be parallel to one another. So the question comes up, what happens when we have two shafts which intersect one another and we want to put a geared connection between them? And the answer to that question actually lies in a cone. And to illustrate this, what I want to do is look at a shot glass, of course, all right? Uh, if we take and push this, you'll notice it doesn't go in a straight line, it goes in an arc. And that's because the diameter, or really the circumference on this end of the shot glass is different from on this end of the shot glass. And so as this moves, this actually wants to go in a curve. Really, this is nothing other than a cone. So let's take a look at an application of cones here. Now what we have is an input shaft, which is coming in at horizontally, and an output shaft, which is running out vertically. Well, it's clear that these two shafts are not parallel like they were in this situation, so we can't use a spur gear. And like I said, we're gonna go back to looking at cones with this. So what we're gonna do is actually put a cone on each of these shafts rather than a wheel. All right, so now what we have is an input shaft connected to a cone. I know this looks like a triangle, but I want you to imagine this as being three-dimensional. This is a cone, all right? Now this cone is, is gonna butt up against or mesh with another cone on our output shaft. Just like when we had two wheels, 
stuck together, we were effectively creating a gear combination. The same issues or the same thing is happening here. I've got one cone pressing up against another cone. Uh, and so as this one turns, it's going to turn this one with it. And so now we're able to transfer power from an input shaft to an output shaft, even though those two shafts are not parallel to each other. Uh, I've drawn these as being at right angles to one another. Uh, now we can also, just like with a, a set of spur gears or with wheels and axles, we can create a gear ratio. And really what that has to do with is the size of this cone versus the size of this cone. Now I'm not worried about the height of the cones. Uh, the, the gear ratio is actually produced by the base circumference of each of these cones. Or really that is to say, if we look at this input shaft and this axis of rotation, if we look at this dimension or the radius of the base of this cone, where that meshes up with the radius or the base of this cone right here, the proportion between these two is effectively our gear ratio. And we'll take a little bit of a, a look at that a bit later. Uh, and then the nice thing about this is once we start looking at things using cones, we don't even have to have our two shafts be at a right angle or parallel to each other, we can put them at just about any angle we choose. So what we have here is, is again, two cones. We've got an input shaft and an output shaft. Uh, and these two cones mesh together, and so that as we transfer power in through one shaft, that is then transferred into the other shaft. And so, just like when we're dealing with spur gears, in both of these situations, we have lines of action. That is, lines along which these cones are going to drive against each other. We have a line of action here, and then on this combination up here, we have a line of action right there. Simply put, the line of action is, is just where these two cones are touching. But just like when we're dealing with spur gears, we run into the same situation as we did when we were treating these as simply wheels. If we have one wheel just butted up against another wheel, they are prone to slip. And to keep them from slipping, we put gear teeth in them. And we can do the same thing with, with these cones as they butt up against each other. To keep these cones from slipping against one another, we can put gear teeth in them. So once we put gear teeth in these cones, we don't call them cones anymore, we call them bevel gears. So to see exactly what that looks like, let's take a look at an actual bevel gear. All right, so what we have here is a bevel gear assembly uh, where we have two shafts which are perpendicular to each other. Now I've drawn them perpendicular to one another, but when you're dealing with bevel gears, they don't have to be at right angles to one another. Uh, this was just the, the simplest way for me to draw these, which was not simple by the way. Uh, so we've got a shaft coming in. Now this could be either the input or output shaft. We'll say for now, this is the input shaft. So this shaft comes in along this axis here. And then we have an output shaft here, and these two shafts, or the axes which these two shafts lie along, would intersect right here. And that just happens to be the point where these two cones are both centered. You can almost think of this like a focal point. Uh, everything on this gear right here 
is pointed at this point or this intersection of these two shafts or these two axes. Same thing with this gear. And so in, in reality or in real life, when you take two cones and try to put them together, there's, there's not a lot of force between them because you're relying on friction. So we simply cut gear teeth into these cones and now we have beveled gears. And so they're actually able to, to mesh against each other just like you would have with a regular set of gears, like say a spur gear. And these teeth, they have to be shaped rather carefully um, because you'll notice as we move from far out on the diameter of this gear towards closer in or, or closer to the intersection of these two axes, the teeth actually have to change in size. The tooth is larger here than it is inward. And so when you're manufacturing bevel gears, these teeth shapes have to be manufactured and machined very, very carefully, which makes them a pretty expensive gear to manufacture. But just like a regular gear, we have a line of action between the gears. And that line of action runs along the intersection between our two cones. And all this line of action is, is simply the, the line along which the gears between the input and output gears mesh. And so they mesh right along this line, or roughly along this line. Uh, that'll vary a little bit with, with the tooth shape. But this is our line of action, just like we would have with, with a standard spur gear. There's nothing different about this. And the fact of the matter is, if we want to go through and calculate a gear ratio, it's no different than we would normally deal with with a, a regular spur gear. Uh, we're simply dealing with gear ratio as being the tooth count of our output gear over the tooth count of our input gear. So bevel gears, much like spur gears, uh, just use this regular gear ratio equation, and that means we can apply this to not only finding a gear ratio based on tooth count, but we can also apply that gear ratio to look at things like torque or angular velocity or power transfer, just like we would with a regular set of spur gears. And the nice thing about bevel gears, much like spur gears, is that either gear can be the input gear, and either gear can be the output gear. So if this shaft right here is the input shaft, that means this gear is gonna turn and that will in turn drive this shaft, so we'll make this the output shaft. But we could flip that around uh, and say this was in fact the output shaft, and that would in turn make this one the input shaft. So this is a little bit like a set of spur gears. You can have a small gear driving a big gear or a big gear driving a small gear. This is different from say something like a worm gear situation where your worm is always going to be driving the worm wheel. Uh, so. So in summation, uh, the nice thing about a bevel gear is it allows us to deal with situations where the input and the output shafts are not parallel to each other. When dealing with spur gears, you have to have input and output shafts running parallel to each other. Uh, bevel gears allow us to have the input and output shafts act in different directions. Now I've drawn these here at right angles, but they don't always have to be at right angles. Uh, that you can have these set up at just about any angle that you want, so long as you're careful about how the teeth are cut. And on that note, that's bevel gears, and that's all for now.